I think you can see that I'm no smarter than anybody else in this room. I just use certain little basic tools to be successful every day. Take the word no out of your vocabulary. Worry about your customer, no spare customers. Use the 95-5 rule. Separate yourself from everybody else. Be the bull at whatever you do. And I don't care if you're in the mail room or if you're the person behind that camera, that I'm gonna be better than anybody else with that camera and I'm gonna be the best mail carrier and the person who comes up and is the most organized and does it the most professional way. You can be the bull at any position you're doing and it's just telling yourself, I'm gonna do this better than anybody else. When I first was really going in the 80s, uh, you hit that horrible recession and people talk about how did banks get so big because the government took a few of the big banks and said, you're going to take the good assets and we're going to take all the bad assets. And that's why you have banks that are too big to fail today because they're roll ups of bank after bank. And in the late eighties were tough and I was getting going and, and, and you just realize when other people were filing bankruptcy, you just got to keep punching and punching and punching. And, and people don't realize how much you can take and, and if you just keep punching and find a way to get out of the mess. And uh, you know what's funny? This is a great story, and I talk about it in the book. I was doing business with like nine or 10 banks in, in the late 80s in Texas, and it was really getting tough and to make payments or whatever, starting to default on some by a few days. Every single bank that I did business with failed before I did. <laughs> is that not a crazy story? And crazy. I know that's hard to believe, but the FDIC would come in every Tuesday into Houston in, in the late 80s and close down four or five or six banks. So over about a, over about a six month period, every single bank failed that I did business with. And you had, you would call and say, so what do I do with these payments? And there was such a bureaucracy. I truly got a three, four year reprieve. Wow. And, and then in, in 1990, I remember somebody calling my office and saying, Mr. Fertitta, we have these uh, notes of yours. We would like you to come in and talk to us. But in that time, I was able to go and, and keep building my company and was able to pay them 100%. That no interest though. You just got to keep punching and just take care of your business and you just realize until they come and shut you down or lock the doors or you can't get product or whatever until you can't make a payroll. You'd be surprised what you can take though. And, and you just keep punching and punching and believe it or not, times, you know, get good. And it goes back to what I once again preach. When times are really bad, we forget they're ever going to be good again. And when times are really good, we forget they're going to be bad again. And we need to always remember that so the paddle doesn't get you. I think one of the best things that I ever did was I will, I will look at somebody's resume and I can say, you know what, you've never been with the right company and that's why you haven't excelled and, and, and you are, that's why you're in here today. And so many people choose the wrong company to go to work for. And I look at people all the time and I look at your resume and say, why did you go to work for this company? I knew they were screwed up when you went to work for them, okay? And so some people just are not good at choosing the right company. And also the person interviewing makes promises that never happen. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is choosing the wrong company. Do they really have good liquidity? Are they gonna be in business? Are they an acquisition target where all of a sudden that they are and you're gonna get bought and probably laid off? Uh, you know, everything is, is uh, do, are they in, do they have a product that is gonna be around for a long time? So everything from liquidity to product, acquisition target, growth, of where are you gonna go? Uh, everybody should always ask themselves if they wanna grow and they just don't wanna just whatever is, is say, where can I be in five years? If I can't be at this position in five years, then this isn't a good career path for me. Even today, it's, it's all about, somebody said, why are you so successful? Because I sell. And even when you go out and you raise billions of dollars in debt, and you're meeting with debt holders, you're still selling yourself. That's what it's all about. You're not just selling the deal. When I was public for 18 years, okay, and you're selling equity, uh, I did five follow-on offerings, the most a restaurant company ever did when I was public. And, uh, and, and you are selling yourself. And, and, and you, know, you know your numbers, you know your business, and you make yourself that you know more than everybody else. By the time I was 26, I built my first hotel. By the time I was 25, I told myself I'll have my first jet at 35, and I did. 
Uh, so uh, I was an investor in a restaurant, uh, and then when the world collapsed in the late 80s, uh, you couldn't develop anything in Texas for the next 10 years. That's when every SNL failed, like I said, every bank failed. And I just started opening restaurants and did that between like 86 and 92 and then 93. I said, well, you know what I'll do? I'll just build restaurants because I understand this business. But since you can't develop anymore and I'll take it public because that's when the whole big thing of restaurant chains going public. Did that for the next 17 years and uh, then was an opportunist, which I always talk about, is that my stock crashed with everybody else in 08 and 09. When I took it public, I owned 100%. In 93, you wake up, you're worth $100 million. I took it private in 09, and you're worth $500 million. Uh, it was very successful, bought it right, and then you know I could really grow then because I didn't have the handcuffs of being a public company. Mm -hmm. Everything is uh, occupancy cost, uh, term of lease, do they own any real estate? Uh, what are their margins? Uh, I'm not real smart, but I know how to do that. Okay, I can analyze the numbers of any business and tell you what your margin should be or whatever because my production cost is this, I have this many subscribers, you should be doing this or that, and I don't care what the business is. So that's what I know how to do. And so if I try to make the right deal and I do heavy due diligence and, and then hopefully you can con continue to grow your network. You know, I think you know if you know business or not. And people ask me, should I go get my MBA? And you know what I usually tell them? You know if you need to go get your MBA. If you don't have it inside of you and you understand economics and finance and, and, and operations of business, then you need to go get it. I knew that I didn't need it. It was just a God-given gift. But also, remember, I didn't get a lot of those other gifts. Don't ask me to play that guitar. Don't ask me to sing you a song. And don't ask me to draw you anything. But, but you've got to know your God-given gifts. And everybody has it. Everybody in this room has it right here. So do what you know was your God-given gift and find a way to use that as your path. Whatever position you're at, you want to be the bull. And I don't care if you're in the mail room or if you're the person behind that camera, that I'm gonna be better than anybody else with that camera and I'm gonna be the best mail uh, carrier and the person who comes up and is the most organized and does it the most professional way. You can be the bull at any position you're doing and it's just telling yourself, I'm gonna do this better than anybody else. I don't care what the job is. I don't care what you do. You be the bull at what you do.